we're going to be in First Thessalonians chapter 2. I don't expect we're going to, I don't have intentions to go real far because we need to reconnect with where we've been in our study. And so that's what we're going to be doing this morning. Uh, the overarching uh, title for our study in Thessalonians is Grounded, Growing, and Glory, uh, and largely focusing on those first two aspects, but at each end of each chapter, there's a reference to the Lord's coming and an anticipa anticipation for that, and uh, obviously with great doctrinal significance, so Grounded, Growing, and Glory. Uh, this morning, as a subtitle beneath that, I've given just this short title of Understanding Service, and I don't know for sure that that's the greatest title. Uh, you might have noticed I don't really get too caught up with the titles or the uh, alliteration of points beneath the message. I much prefer just to get into the passage and walk our way through. It does happen to be, though, that most of the points this morning underneath our study are going to begin with the letter S, and it's because much of that is born out in the passage. Uh, as we come into this passage, we've already spent a Sunday at least dealing with verse 1 and understanding the nature of 1 Thessalonians as, as Paul writes to them, you see at the very beginning of chapter 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians and he's addressing this church as a church that is healthy in many, many ways. I think it falls under the banner of what we would quite often call discipleship as a particular book, book to turn to with discipleship in mind because Paul is talking to these young believers. He's talking to uh, people who are recently saved and they're growing and uh, as you look at what he's teaching them, uh, there are obviously things that through the inspiration of God and giving us this book or this epistle uh, that God would want us to know. But at its core is this idea of discipling or bringing into maturity these believers who had recently come to know the Lord. There is great attestment to the fact uh, that they were not just babes, but they were evidently growing. Uh, they were standing for their faith. They were doing things that were mature in their walk with the Lord uh, that Paul was commending them uh, for and about. So we read in verse 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where he says, For yourselves, brethren... Know our entrance in unto you, that it was not vain, or not in vain. And the idea there that we spent a large time speaking about is that there was an entrance that Paul had, and that entrance was not only his coming in, but it was how he was received by those Thessalonian believers. And this happens every time you come into a service. Uh, there is a way or an attitude with which we approach um, a message and approach someone preaching or teaching the Word of God. Sometimes it can be carnal, sometimes it can be spiritual. It really depends on where we're at. Sometimes we can come into a church where um, we didn't want to be in service at all that day. By the way, if you ever come into a service where you don't want to be there, uh, how does that affect you during a service? Well, it can become, it can become very difficult, right? It can become very difficult, and I, I know sometimes there's the attitude of um, maybe uh, someone's invited to someone's church, and, and they kind of came begrudgingly, and now you got this guy up there who's going to speak, and immediately for how long, and, and, uh, and why should I listen to this guy anyway? And I, I just, uh, I know that we come with those kinds of mindsets. I think I can say clearly on that last point, really, I have nothing good to offer if it's not based on the truth of the word. And so, um, while I have nothing good, the Word of God has everything good to offer, and it's our goal to represent that uh, in this service. But he says here that they knew the entrance in, and that it was not in vain. It was not in vain because it was well received. There was an attitude of receiving them and understanding the nature of the ministry that they had among uh, the Thessalonian believers. But verse 2 is where we're anchoring in this morning. And we read, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. 
So there is in this that their ministry was not vain amongst the Thessalonians, but also there was a backstory to their being there. There was a backstory to what it meant to be a servant of God by Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus, or Timothy. So in verse 2, I'm going to lay out here these three S's, or four, three or four S's that we have, actually three, and there was a, there, it, they are these. They suffered, they were shamefully entreated, and they spoke. Three, these three aspects are all part of what we see in verse 2. Now, before I get into it, here's the idea. Sometimes we have expectations of something before we ever get into it. Sometimes we have a predisposed mindset of what something is going to be like before we get fully involved. And Paul is speaking to these Thessalonians uh, and helping them to understand and remember what ministry looked like in their lives. And to a point, in other words, in this first point of, of suffering, he's really underscoring the fact that his labor for the Lord came at a cost, and a cost that the Thessalonians were well aware of. The cross-references that we would have here are a few. One that I would take us to is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It's something that I think that we should know. So I'm going to read this to us before we go there. It says, but even after that we had suffered before. Now, we're going to reference that further moving forward, but take your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Suffering in the ministry. Is it true that if you're a believer and you have a walk with God, that everything will be easy? And that a testament, a testament to walking with God is that you will not have trouble in your life. Now, this, this seems rare. I, I would say this seems really evident in the scriptures, but it's worth noting here today. There is something out there that many of us have, have known for some time that would be called the prosperity gospel. And that is along the lines that if you're walking with God, you won't have trouble. If you're walking with God, you will only feel blessing. And the definition of blessing is happy times, nothing bad. And even to the idea that if you have a sniffle or a cold or a sickness, uh, in that theology, really those who uh, would hold to the prosperity gospel would equate that with some kind of spiritual deficiency that we might have. And if we were just walking with God, we wouldn't deal with those things. Now, the reason it seems that we would address these things are, first of all, because that doctrine and that philosophy is in the world. But we would address it secondarily because it seems pretty evident to me that that is not equal to what the scriptures teach. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and following, we read a, a discourse that Paul is having over false teachers, and he's having to lay out the idea in the Corinthian church that there, were, there was a reception uh, by the Corinthians of people who were false teachers that for whatever reason had charisma or were self-boasting. And Paul uncomfortably has to step in and say, I have qualifications as well. And, and he doesn't really want to speak along these lines, but does so. And in the doing so, he, he draws back the curtain of what it looks like for him to be in ministry. Now, before I read this and, and note this, we're reading and building off of this concept in verse 2, but even after that, we had suffered. The idea of us coming to grips with the, uh, or coming to grips with the idea that when we surrender to the Lord, there can be suffering involved. And most often at some point in the Christian life, that will become evident. Now, I don't want to speak in just generic terms. Now, I could ask it this way. Are any of you suffering today? Well, you might have a context to that. But I think to ask that question generically is not healthy in line with what the Bible is teaching here. This is not, I'm suffering because I have this ache 
or this pain or this thing going on in my life. The suffering that he is speaking about is a suffering that is known specifically by being in the service of the Lord. It comes directly as a result of being connected with Christ. It comes directly as a result of not being willing to say what everybody else says and to do what everyone else does. It really comes directly as being one who says, I, as a believer, want to declare the truths and the messages of God and hold those in higher regard than any other view. When you stand in that position, you find suffering. And I'm going to say that the reason this message would be a little strange in the context of our world today is I'm going to argue as something that's going to come up later is because Christians are becoming more and more silent about our walk with God, even within Christian circles. <clears throat> So here, what he's laying down is this. They, the Thessalonian believers had a reception of these men, and they were in a place of receiving them gladly so that they actually bore fruit in their lives. And he says there's a backstory in knowing that in the ministry or, ser or service of God, there is suffering involved. And here is one of those passages that shows us that, 2 Corinthians 11 where we read, picking up in Paul's answer to the Corinthian believers in verse 23. He says, are they ministers of Christ? Again, loathing to go here, he says, I speak as a fool, I am more. He goes on to say, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths off. Now, if you were to lay that down and say, hey, I want to encourage all of God's people to sign up for ministry today, and this was the verse you read, who's going to sign up? Right? I mean, when you read that, does that sound like uh, what your dreams and aspirations would be for your future? Matter of fact, uh, as you look into 2020, does anyone want to say, hey, I want to sign up for some suffering? Nobody wants to go there. But he's laying out the reality of sometimes of what ministry can look like. So let me say this as clearly as I know how to say it. To be a Christian, you have to be wholly surrendered and dependent upon God. And there's one other aspect I think I need to say to everybody. You actually need to have a backbone. You actually have to be a person who has grit to say, I'm going to stand behind the truths of God no matter what. Now let me ask you, how do you think we're doing with that? How temperamental are we as believers? I'm asking, by the way, I don't have an answer. I'm asking you. These are the things I think about. How, how fickle are we about ministry? Well, let me ask you. If we were to examine the modern church with all of its divisions, are we fickle? Are we, what's a good word? <laughs> I don't know what a good word is. Are we... Uh, are we easily distracted from serving God because we have issues one with another? I mean, obviously, he's going to go further here. I mean, he's already laid out some pretty heavy consequences. He said stripes, prisons, and death, not to mention the more rudimentary part of labor. Verse 24, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Five times. Now, I don't know everybody's testimony in here, but I don't know any believer yet. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe the context is more broad than I would know, but um, I don't know too many believers who, who've suffered in this fashion. Okay? But he goes on and he says in verse 25, three times or thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned, three times or thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. 
Verse 26, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Now, time out. I'm not talking about the general suffering. This is not general suffering. What kind of suffering is this? What is this related to? This suffering is related most specifically to the service of the king. So the context for each of these isn't, I had something bad happen to my life. It's each of these happened as I was serving my Lord as a direct result of serving God. Now I'm asking, do you agree? Is that, is that what it's saying or is this general suffering? Well, it seems to me all these are tied to direct service of the Lord. Now, in verse 27, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold <coughs> and nakedness. Now, he goes on to say in verse 28, another it's not a parenthetical, but it's a whole other category. He says, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, and specifically, he says, the care of all the churches. Now, Paul is not doing any of this as a woe is me. That's not the point. Matter of fact, if you go through and you look at what Paul is doing, He's laying all this out so that he can actually be heard and received by the Corinthian believers. So that they would receive the doctrine that he would be giving. So that they would not discount the truths of the message of God's word or the messenger, but would be receptive to hearing the word. All right, so we come back to 1 Thessalonians. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, But even that after we had suffered before... And the idea there is simply this, that when we serve our Lord, and most specifically when we're actively engaged in that, there is going to be at some point a confrontation with the worldview of everyone who is not a believer. And really, the message for us today is knowing this. And making this kind of a commitment, I am going to serve my Lord, and I would kind of like to say it this way, period. I'm going to serve him and live for him no matter what everybody else is doing. And that takes a great deal of commitment, but really what it's talking about is devotion. It's talking about this simple aspect, I love my Lord, and I'm going to serve him. So I'm going to ask you that. Do you love your Lord? Now, I want to settle it in because you remember the Lord asked Peter this three times. So I'm going to ask you again, do you love your Lord? And, and by the way, nobody can answer that for you. It's, and nobody can really know where you are but you. I think some argument can be made that sometimes we don't even know where we are with that. Hence, the Lord asking Peter three times. But when we love our Lord, we're going to be fiercely committed to him and fiercely committed to his truths and fiercely committed to doing whatever he has called us to do. Now, I'm going to tell you that the church today, not speaking simply of fellowship, though I don't think fellowship is excluded from this. I think the church today, I, I of course know more about the church in the United States than I do worldwide, but I think the church in general is riddled with a type of Christianity that will serve as long as it doesn't involve any kind of suffering. Matter of fact, I had to do a survey the other day. Do you guys like surveys? I had to do a survey and it asked this very personal question. It said, do you like to exercise? 
Now, some of you are very strange people and would say yes. Um, do I like to exercise? I think many people would say, well, I would love to exercise if it didn't hurt. <laughs> I would love to exercise if it didn't have any pain with it. My son asked me this the other day. I still don't know the answer for this. I don't know why it was this way. This is some time ago he asked me, but yeah, I've often referenced when I was in, in high school and college, uh, there was a wrestling room downstairs and there was a weight room upstairs. Uh, I lifted weights. Um, you know, there was a time in most, uh, most young men where you kind of get into that stuff. So I lifted weights, but I can tell you this, I don't know of any time that I ever enjoyed it. And I worked hard at it. I don't know of any time that I didn't enjoy it. And there was one reason why. Um, every time I lifted weights, every time I lifted weights, I would lift weights to the point where I would be nauseous and I'd be at the door of throwing up. And it got to where even go going into the room and smelling the room evoked that reaction from me. So I can't say that I ever really enjoyed it. And when you don't enjoy something, you tend not to what? When you don't enjoy something, you tend not to do it. Well, here's the thing. Listen, if our service to God is going, going to be contingent upon everything I do in the service of the Lord is happy, everything I do in the service of the Lord is, is sunshine and tulips and, and there's no hardships, we will forever remain in position as believers, as babes in Christ. It's not any different than us sitting at the table. By the way, uh, just great kudos to my wife and all that she does to help our little boy to grow. You know this as parents. You know, I, I watch her. <clears throat> By the way, <clears throat> the, unique, the uniqueness of Joseph is different than all of our other kids. He has the lightest um, reflex trigger in gagging than all of our other kids. I'm not kidding. I don't know what it is. Matter of fact, you know when you look at your kids, you're like, you don't want to say it out loud, but you're thinking, something's wrong with you. Um, but he, you, if he, we, we've come to this. We have to tell him, chew your food. Now, he's, he's two. He's going to be three in March. But we have to tell him, you've got to chew because if he doesn't chew, he will gag every time. Hey, mom's on one side. I'm on the other. I would love to say I'm telling him to chew because I'm love, I love him, but it's really I don't want to be thrown up on. And, and he will. I mean, we'll put it in his mouth, and he'll immediately go, and I'll say, chew, chew, chew. And he'll start chewing and he'll get it down. But, you know, she's patient and she continues to help him eat. Let me ask you, if you're two to three, do you think you have an opinion about food yet? Does he have to be encouraged to eat the right things? Well, yes, just like you and I do, actually. Except for maybe mom's not over our shoulder saying, hey, eat that, you know. The point is, serving God is about our walk with the Lord and our love for Him. And I'm just saying that too often we leave churches, we stop serving for the most fickle of reasons. And I would argue reasons that often have nothing to do with the gospel. And so at some point, we have to come to a realization by looking at these passages and understanding that sometimes suffering is a part of what we experience, and more than sometimes, actually, as we begin to, as we'll see later, speak about the Lord, the more evident that suffering is going to become. Now, he goes on to say in verse 2, even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated. They were shamefully entreated, and this is really a reference, and you can take your Bibles there. It's a reference to Acts chapter 16. So we know in Paul's journeys that he winds up landing in Thessalonica as a part of his missionary travels. And so this is part of what he had experienced and part of what we had read in 2 Corinthians. But in Acts chapter 16, he lays out 
what had happened to him in being shamefully entreated. And he's recounting, not in specific detail this instance, but in his going to Thessalonia, this would have been part of the backstory of what got him there. So they were shamefully entreated. Well, how were they shamefully entreated? In Acts chapter 16, what you have is you have Paul and Silas traveling about and they are declaring who Christ is. There is a demon-possessed lady who is actually trailing them and she's basically saying continually and loudly, listen to these servants of God. And Paul rebukes the demon in her. And it may sound confusing. Why would he rebuke this lady who is who's saying, listen to these servants of God? And it's because they, it was uh, associated with a false god or a false deity. And so Paul rebukes it and she was one who could basically tell people's futures and things like that. And in doing so, it winds up affecting those who own this lady as a slave. So we pick up in verse 19. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto ruler, unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrate saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. As far as I can understand the language, what it means is they, they stripped them and beat them. As, as far as what I can see, there's a couple different ideas about that, but the very short of it is they were beaten. Verse 23, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. If this is you, if this is me, what, is, what would our reactions be to this circumstance? Now, again, I can't speak for you. But my mind tends to go down these, this road of thinking, hey, I'm serving the Lord, I'm being faithful, and now I'm not only in prison, being in prison would be enough, right? If you were, if you were wrongfully accused and you land in prison, that's enough to make a bad day for all of us. But there's more to it than that. They are beaten. They are beaten and then thrown into the prison. Uh, now, if, if that's you, what's your reaction? Well, my, my reaction might carnally, I'm going to say carnally be, my fleshly reaction, I think most specifically be, Lord, why have you done this to me? For you are the sovereign of all. You are the great and almighty God. You control all things. You could have stopped this. Why would you let this happen to me? But that's not all I would say. Why would you let this happen to me when I'm serving you? The word shamefully treated back in 1 Thessalonians, we won't leave this passage yet, but the word shamefully treated is hubridzo, and it means to exercise violence. It means to exer exercise violence upon someone. It is most specifically the idea of abusing somebody. Okay? So it's one thing to have that happen. It's another thing to have it happen when you've been doing something that is right or good, specifically in the service of God. Now, if that's you and that's me, I don't know how you react, but I certainly don't do what they do. Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. And at midnight, now why midnight? I don't know. Were they up because of the wounds? Could they not sleep because they were suffering? I do not know, but for whatever reason, they're at midnight, they're in the prison. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners, what? The prisoners heard them. So here at midnight, these two men who've been beaten for serving the Lord and are suffering physically are now at a place of praying and singing praises to God. So, I take this personally 
as a challenge to me about my own steadfastness in serving the Lord. So I've got a question for you. Has anybody ever mistreated you in church? Has anybody ever offended you in church? And it's when I start going down that line of thinking that I think how temperamental we are. I'm going to be upset because somebody didn't do exactly what I would do. Or somebody, let me ask you, have you ever been misunderstood? Here's a, here's a greater question. Have you ever been greatly bothered because you were misunderstood? And yet, wouldn't you agree that those types of things are far, far, far less than what Paul is describing in his sufferings? So what I'm saying is that God has called us to a place as believers to having some degree of maturity in our lives where serving the Lord isn't done just because it was easy. Serving the Lord wasn't done just because uh, it didn't hurt me to do it. I wrote it down this way. Sometimes we are willing to serve as long as it's without suffering. Sometimes we are willing to be involved as long as it doesn't involve inconvenience. Now, I know how this service can feel. This is, this is what you might call, some people might call this a, a hard-hitting message. I don't really see it that way. I see it as a wake-up call to me to be steadfast in my walk with God. And here's simply the question, will you serve the Lord, period? Even when there's a cost. Will you serve the Lord even when it's not convenient? Will you serve the Lord when other believers around you mistreat you? Let me ask you, how much of our Bible would we have if Paul would have stopped preaching and teaching the Word of God because believers were mean to him? How much Bible would we have? Well, the truth is that Paul is often, through the inspiration of God, addressing people who were not receiving him well. So there is this call in this passage of understanding that the service of God will involve suffering. It will involve, in verse 2, this idea of being shamefully entreated. And by the way, I just, I just got this question for you. The idea, remember, Huprizo is when we talk about shamefully entreated, huprizo isn't the idea of mocking somebody. When we talk about shaming someone, this isn't the idea of embarrassing them. Huprizo is the idea of exercising violence upon them. Okay? Are we willing to serve even if that's the case. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to be very, 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 very direct right now. I don't know this to be true. I just know human nature. And in a gathering of this size, I know or highly suspect that there will be people who are riding the fence of trying to say, I want to be... Um, I want a life of ease and I want to be accepted by my friends. I really don't want to rock the boat. And so this idea of being completely sold out to God, I don't know that I'm really quite there because I don't want all the cost of what that means. The idea that if I really sell out for the Lord, I might lose. Well, what might you lose? What might you lose? Someone said, Job, what else might you lose? You might lose your friends. You might lose family. You might lose how people think of you in, in some fashion. So let me, nobody can answer this for you, but here's the question that God would have for all of us. Is he truly our Lord or not? Do we truly love him or not? And when I start asking these questions, don't you see how we can start evaluating? Maybe we are a little bit temperamental. Now, here's the other thing. Nobody can make you love God. Nobody can make me love God. There's only one, I would say, arguably one major influence in the world that causes us to love God, and that's the Lord himself. Amen. Who continually in his mercy and his grace is drawing us despite our misbehavior. Amen. 
drawing us despite, and again, maybe hard for you to hear, but I, I own this, loves us despite our shallowness sometimes, loves us despite our, our lacking. He loves us anyway and continues to draw us into a fellowship with him even when we're not all that we should be. Now, this passage is going to level it out here at the end. He says, but even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated. As you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our gospel to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. All right, so the last part of our message together, our time in the word this morning, is this last phrase. They spoke. So they suffered, they were shamefully entreated, and they spoke. All right, now I, I don't want to make too much of this because I don't, maybe I'm not going to say it just the right way. So I'm going to ask you to give some grace to how I'm going to say it and you can help me to evaluate it and find a better way to say it. I don't know of any place, at least especially in the context of this passage, where our steadfastness in the Lord is really going to be exhibited more than this litmus test. And I, I didn't... Just so you know, <laughs> uh, maybe it's not helpful for you to know. So in the message this morning, this is our, these are our notes, and we're to hear. And I, I fully anticipated that, uh, don't be alarmed. But these two sheets are passages where you can look up and largely, almost every one of these passages that are listed out here are in the book of Acts. Specifically, these passages are referencing when Paul spoke boldly for Christ. My point there is simply this, that I don't think there's any greater arena that shows our steadfastness or opens the door to the arena of suffering and sacrifice perhaps being shamefully entreated, than the litmus test of are we speaking Christ? And what I'm going to argue there is, is this point, and, it, and part of the reason I'm arguing it is because I see it in the passage, but I'm burdened about this personally. I've asked the church to be in prayer for me, specifically, that I would be bold in declaring Jesus. But I do believe that the modern church is becoming more and more silent about Christ. Now, I don't think that means that everybody's being silent 100% of the time. I just know in my own life, and I believe uh, as I reference other pastors and other churches, that it's a commonality that believers are really struggling in the idea of speaking about Jesus. Now, you can argue over why is that so, and there could be a lot of reasons given. But here, what Paul simply said is that he had made a decision. And it wasn't a decision based on the idea that if he did this, there would not be suffering. If he did this, there would not be ill treatment. Instead, he had made a decision to be surrendered to the hand of God. And he asked people to pray for him about this. But he says they were bold in our God, he says, to speak unto you, the Thessalonians, the gospel of God, and here you have it, with much contention. The idea of with much contention can be taken a couple different ways. With much contention has the idea that he contended greatly, explaining greatly uh, the truths of the word of God. That's one aspect of explaining this verse. The other aspect of this is to teach the truths of God, even when there are adversaries fighting you all along the way. But regardless of whichever arena that was, he was bold to speak Jesus. All right, so I'm going to put it to you this way, and, and this, these next verses, actually verses 3 through 8, verse 3 in particular, he's going to make that case again. We'll pick that up next week. But here's the challenge that I see for this, out of, out of this passage from my own life, and I would challenge you with not just today, but throughout this year. 
I would encourage you in some fashion, however you do it, is to begin not only to ask God to give you boldness to speak Jesus, but then start paying attention to how often we are speaking Jesus to others. Amen? Amen. So in whatever fashion that is, and I'm not saying that every time you do it, that you are able to give the full Romans road or share all the gospel, but just simply that we would start the conversation about Jesus. Now, I don't know how we'll do that as a church, but here's something else that I'm burdened about. I, I want this to be a, a staple in the culture and conversation of this body. I want us to be able to come together and to share with one another, hey, I got to speak to someone about Jesus this week. Hey, I got to talk to some... By, by the way, have you been surprised in the past at how God opens a door about the conversation about Christ with the smallest of things? Sometimes God can use the smallest of circumstances to open the door. I was talking to a sister recently, and it was something... As a matter of fact, it was started by a coworker that came to them and said, I understand you go to church. They didn't initiate the conversation. A coworker initiated that conversation, and they were surprised by that conversation coming to them. My point is, just don't sell short what God can do with you as you begin to speak Jesus. And I am fully convinced of this truth. I believe that we will see more people saved the more we speak Jesus. I, I know this to be true, that more seed will certainly be planted as we speak Jesus. Now, I am also going to tell you this. There isn't any one program of the church that does this. I'm going to tell you why. Not that I think programs are bad. Programs are really just the administration of how you do something. And, and maybe there's going to come a day when we're going to get a lot more organized about how to do this because I'm certainly burned about it. But part of the reason this isn't highly administrated is because this is a foundational truth for all believers. In other words, your church, and I, I pray to the Lord this will not be the case, and I certainly hope it's not the testimony of the church today, but it may be that your church does not overtly do a lot in programs with the gospel. It still doesn't take it away from me personally that I am a steward of the gospel. Now, that being said, that is exactly where Paul goes with this in the preceding or the next verses. Stewardship about the gospel. Now, I'm done. The service is over, except for this last application, and that is simply for you to take this message and not be discouraged with what you haven't done. That is not, you didn't hear anywhere in this message have you given the gospel to five people this week? You didn't hear anywhere in this message, how many people have you led to the Lord in the past, bop, bop, bop. You didn't hear any of that. Why? It's because that can immediately go to a carnal evaluation, and really it doesn't get you anywhere. The only value it might get you is saying, I know I haven't been, but I can make this decision today. I want to be in the service of my king. And I want to be used of God, and I would just like all of God's people to begin to consider this personally. How can you be bold to speak the gospel? How can you be bold to speak about the Lord? And let the Lord use you where you are. Now, I, I do want to encourage you with this. I know that our people are doing it because many of you are telling me that. I'm going to tell you how else I know you're doing it. I will often see visitors come here that are the direct result of your speaking Jesus into their life in some fashion. And praise God that happens. I hope that you can partner with me in my burden, not just for me personally, but the burden that we would have for our church, that we would be good at speaking Jesus. So may God use this message this morning, this first message of this year. For us all year long, I, I would love to look at the end of this year, if God tarries, 
I'd love to look at the end of this year and be able to look back and see how many people came to the Lord because we began the practice of speaking Jesus.